Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The crisis of fentanyl has been discussed a lot. I want to echo what my colleagues on both sides of the aisle have said and what you have said. This is an American crisis. It shouldn't divide us against each other. We need to find where the common cause and common urgency is and attack those areas. We should be guided by the facts and the evidence and not the typical political forces that divide us that make it difficult to solve problems. We will not agree on everything. But the facts are the facts. This problem did not start under Joe Biden. In fact, Mr. Secretary, during the years of the Trump administration, fentanyl deaths rose in America, correct? Uh, yes, they did. Um, That's all I need. This problem has risen under Republican presidents and Democratic presidents. This is not a partisan issue. This is an American issue. This is an American crisis. And more facts that I think are worthy of repeating and saying clearly is that this is an issue that is being driven by criminals from our country. The data shows that US citizens are accounting for 86% of fentanyl trafficking convictions, 86%. When I visited the border recently, down in Brownsville, the Customs and Border Professionals, professionals every day that seek to serve the security of this nation, made it very clear that this is overwhelmingly Americans being stopped coming through ports of entry, that 91% of the fentanyl enters our country through these ports of entry. Can you affirm that, sir? Uh, Senator, it is my information indeed that the majority of fentanyl coming into this country is coming in through the ports of entry uh, over 90%. And American citizens are the majority of people being arrested? So that is a, a statistic with which I am not familiar. Uh, and, um, uh, but certainly we see American citizens uh, at, as traffickers in fentanyl. Uh, as I referenced uh, just a few minutes ago, yesterday I was briefed most recently on Operation Blue Lotus, and indeed we apprehended uh, for prosecution two American citizens who were trafficking in multi-kilograms of fentanyl. Well, sir, I want to point out the GAO report on June, 20, June of 2022, which found that 91% of drug seizures, seizure events involve only U.S. citizens. Now, this isn't to say that undocumented immigrants are not a part of the problem. Uh, they account for about 9%. But we need to be operating on the facts. The guns that the cartels are using are coming from where? Uh, a great number of them are coming from the United States. Uh, well, give me, can you contextualize a great number? Is 20%, 30%? Are the majority of the guns being used by these cartels coming from the United States or not? Yes, that is my understanding. It is why, indeed, we have surged resources uh, to interdict the flow, uh, the illegal flow of firearms to the south. So to present this as a problem that is just a Mexico problem and not discuss the facts that the weapons that the cartels are using, the majority of, according to your testimony, are coming from the United States, that the majority of the people we are arresting coming across the border trafficking, that they are coming through the ports of entry, means that we have to look to solutions that meet the facts of the crisis. Is that correct? That is correct. Should this country <laughs> be, as, as, as Customs and Border agents told me, and again, these don't sound like very politically controversial issues. We need more resources at our borders and our ports of entry that enable modern cutting edge technology to be used to detect the presence of fentanyl. Would that help the problem? Yes, it would, Senator. And, and I should say that we are deploying an unprecedented level of modern technology to interdict fentanyl. Our non-intrusive inspection technology is extraordinarily effective, and we are exploring the use of artificial intelligence to serve as a force multiplier. I was in, uh, I was in Arizona last week. Not only did I see the non-intrusive inspection technology, which I've seen 
uh, in many of my visits to the border. I think I've made 16 as the secretary, but I also uh, learned from uh, our colleagues about the forward operating labs that we now deploy to the ports of entry. So personnel expert in the identification of the particular narcotic at issue can analyze it, confirm its identity, and bring the appropriate prosecution to bear. And, and so if there's an action for Congress that, that could be a bipartisan effort would be to surge the resources to be, further expand the cutting edge technology necessary to detect the fentanyl and to arrest the folks who are trafficking. That's a clear yes, yes? Yes. That's all. The second thing that reminded me of my work doing law enforcement in my city as mayor is that we found that too many of our police officers were engaged in activities that weren't the highest and best use when it came to stopping and preventing crime. So again, we need to protect our overall border and technology that was discussed with me by Customs and Border Control that could use high tech sensory, all different types of, of technologies from motion detectors to aerial surveillance, they would tell me would free up considerable amounts of our Customs and Border Patrol to focus more on where exactly the fentanyl is coming from. Even more than that, I, I, when you have the, a surge of asylum seekers, they were telling me stories about too many of their Customs and Border Patrol simply doing data entry, dealing with the asylum seekers, as opposed to having those officers do the things at the, at, at, that what we know we're, uh, and focusing on where we know the problem is. And so they talked about just simply some of the things we did when I was mayor of the city of Newark, getting civilians in to do the basic data entry jobs and, and freeing up officers to focus on ports of entry, where their highest and best use is. And so from the technology to protect our border to too many people sitting behind desks with guns and officers, do you agree with me that we could be finding ways to better use the manpower, woman power, person power that we have to, to focus on where the actual problem is? Yes, and we are doing that. And let me, let me repeat very, very briefly. Um, our use of technology uh, and our exploration of AI, artificial intelligence, as a force multiplier to liberate some of our personnel from some of the more m mundane tasks that could be uh, accomplished by machines. Sir, machine. I, I would like to Second. learn more about that. I have two minutes left. I'd l I really want to hear more about that because when I was on the border, I heard from a lot of your agents the urgency to do this. I know you're making progress and I'd like to hear more, but I, I just. And we're also adding case processors to make sure that the agents, the uniformed agents, can be back out in the field. We have surged those resources in an unprecedented right. way. There's always going to be partisan differences. There's always going to be divisions in our country, but the lines that divide us are nowhere near as strong as the ties that bind us. We all care. We all are having people dying in our communities, people we know, families we meet with. And yet there, there is so much room for us to work together where we agree and to get things done and support the agents on the ground, that when I meet with them, they're some of the proudest, most dedicated patriotic Americans. In the, in the few seconds I have left, sir, last week the Anti-Defamation League released its annual report examining anti-Semitic incidents. According to the ADL, in 2022, there were at least 3,697 anti-Semitic incidents throughout the United States. This is a 36% increase from the 2,717 incidents tabulated in 2021. It's the highest number on record since the ADL started tracking. Anti-Semitism is at a stunning rise and the highest we're ever detecting. This is, to me, absolutely frightening. The number one targeted religious group in our country. I know the D D Department of Homeland Security released a toolkit for communities to better understand how to, how to protect themselves. I think it's a valuable resource. But could you please, just in the last 30 seconds I have, how is the department approaching community-driven solutions to the kind of violent extremism that threatens Jewish Americans, Sikh Americans, Muslim Americans, that are beginning to, to, to have so many of our religious minorities being targeted in the United States? In the 10 seconds that I have, uh, disseminating information so everyone is aware of the threat 
providing advice with respect to the hardening of vulnerable locations, providing $20 million in grant funds uh, each year to allow um, places of worship, uh, religious schools, uh, community-based organizations to increase uh, their level of security. This requires a whole of community approach and our, our, our Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships is extraordinarily devoted to that. Well, well, we have more to do collectively as a Congress and in your agency, more must be done. Hate has no harbor in the United States of America. These incidents are on a rise and I would ask my colleagues for all of us uh, to do more in partnership with those who are protecting us in our communities to address the scourge of anti-Semitism and violence against religious minorities in our country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Booker. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Secretary Mayorkas.